this might be a bit of an abbreviated lecture because we went over um, with the discussion of the reading materials just now. But I thought we would um, spend a little bit of time talking about a subject that we kind of glossed over and not, uh, not discussed in too much detail yet, but it's been, it's been sort of at the heart of everything that you've read so far with this course, which I guess I would define as tone um, or voice or style, something along those kind of um, vague cryptic lines, because these are really aspects of storytelling that are difficult to operationalize or to define clearly. We kind of have a sense of what they are, but when we uh, try to define those terms, they can be a bit elusive. But perhaps we'll um, get to the bottom of it um, with, with some examples, at least, of different types of voice and style. So as we've seen throughout, um, it's critical that we only include information and details um, in our narratives that are serving some clear storytelling purpose. There's this sort of conventional wisdom, I guess, that the more details you have, the more sort of um, rich, especially sensory-based details that you provide in the context of the story, the better, because it makes it more immersive, it brings it to life, it feels like you're on the scene. But in reality, um, we can go, it can go horribly bad if we put too much sensory-based details into the plot. And because although we want people to be, you know, to feel as if they're a character sort of on the scene watching things happen um, for the purposes, I guess, of setting a mood, uh, it could also be sort of a, um, that could be a glut of too much of those details. So when we think about mood, I guess, or atmospheric, sort of, uh, or an ambiance to our stories, um, you can see how just the, the setting is going to critically affect that. Whether it takes place, for example, on a subway station or a lakeside cottage, um, and we the story sort of proceeds from there. Just the physical setting or the scenery is going to influence um, the mood that that we find ourselves in, and that's sort of the author or the, the filmmaker or whatever is trying to create that, that tone, that overall tone. But again, it's the, um, the details that count when we're talking about settings and, and scenery um, and the sort of the physical venue or the lo location of um, where things are happening with our characters. So I think this excerpt from uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, we'll hear from Rebecca Sloot soon, maybe you could ask her about this in particular. Um, she does a really good job at creating um, a sense of setting, a sense of setting and mood and atmosphere with just the right amount of information included in it. So here she's talked, she, this is a scene basically where um, Rebecca Sloot, who's a sort of young, ambitious journalist, writing this around the time she was about 30, I think, uh, had stumbled upon the story years earlier of Henrietta Lacks, um, who was this intriguing character, sort of forgotten to history, um, whose uh, cell line culture had been developed and capitalized on across the world for medical research purposes. Um, so she was trying to find the actual woman behind the, um, the, the, cell, the cell line. So this woman, she, just, she, she found out her name was Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she died in 1951. She was uh, a granddaughter, I believe, of slaves. Um, she grew up as a sharecropper, uh, living in really impoverished conditions in rural Virginia. Um, this was her childhood home. This, uh, this was this is actual slave quarters at one point, but this is where Henrietta Lacks grew up in the early 1900s. 
And um, at this point, when Rebecca Sploot sort of came on the scene as this journalist trying to tell the story, the place had fallen completely into disrepair. It wasn't, it wasn't in good shape to begin with, but as you can see, it was completely um, uh, on the brink of just collapsing. But her description of the inside of this, it just puts you right there. So she says, that this is, uh, she's talking to um, the cousin of Henrietta Lacks, uh, this guy named Cliff, who still lived in the area, and he took her on this sort of tour. He said, that there is the old home house where Henrietta grew up, Cliff yelled, pointing. We walked toward it through red dirt and dried leaves that cracked under our feet, the air smelling of wild roses, pine, and cows. So there's some really rich, vibrant, sensory-based details. Um, the leaves cracking under our feet, the air smelling of wild roses, pine, and cows. You can almost taste it in your mouth or smell it. Henrietta kept it nice. He said, a real home house. Now I can't hardly recognize it. So then they go inside, and here she's describing the interior of this dilapidated um, cabin. The floors inside were covered with straw and manure. They collapsed in several places under the weight of cows that now run free on the property. Upstairs in the room Henrietta once shared with Day, this was um, another cousin who would eventually become her husband. A few remnants of life lay scattered on the floor. A tattered work, that should be boot, with metal eyes but no laces. A trade soda bottle with a white and red label. A tiny woman's dress shoe, sorry, shoe with open toes. I wondered if it was Henrietta's. So you can see the, the list of objects that um, the author is including in describing the interior of the house serves a purpose. What, what does this tell us about um, the conditions that Henrietta Lacks grew up in, uh, or the type of woman that she might have been? What do you, what do you think? What does this description of the, uh, of the former home of Henrietta Lacks tell us about who Henrietta Lacks was as a person? Smart, diligent. She was diligent. So that's based on what her cousin was saying, right? OK, what about just the physical setting, though? Right. But she had like uh, a little bit of dignity about her. Good. Like, she had a sense of dignity. She kind of did that. Like, it doesn't really want to be her. Like, her wondering if it was Henrietta's was kind of like putting her view of Henrietta into the book. Right. But without saying that. And this is just a snapshot, of course, yeah. from the rest of the book. And throughout the book, there are there is reference to Henrietta being quite um, meticulous about her physical appearance. And she dressed nicely. And she kept yeah. a nice home. And, so, so that, yeah, that detail about the dress shoe. It further supports this the word persona. Word, the word fruit maybe you could imagine was there. Mm -hmm. Right. But do you see how the, the elements, this list of the list of items in the house, and also just sort of the description of the surroundings of the house and what it smelled like, for instance, that it's not just sort of random descriptions. Um, of everything, I mean, just imagine that there's probably a, a millions of bits of sensory detail that she could have included in terms of this description of the scene, um, or you know, other bits and pieces in the house that she could have included in the list, but she didn't. She was selective with the way that she uh, presented the information. So we can, if we're thinking about um, writing stories and trying to make them as vivid and rich and saturated with phenomenal or sensory-based experiences of the characters, just be cautious, I guess, of going overboard with the amount of material that you provide. So um, if I'm reading a story about some woman driving on a country road and um, the author is talking about how what it feels like to have the sun on the back of, of her hands as she's driving down the road and the warmth of the sun in her hands or you know, the fact that she can still taste the strawberry in her mouth that she ate for breakfast and um, that the steering wheel is cool to the touch. You know, why are, we, why are you telling us this? I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting, but if it doesn't really serve a purpose, um, then 
that's just information that the word gonna sort of uh, um, raise our eyes over in terms of, because we're looking for some reason that we're getting this information basically. So, so you need to ask yourself, I guess, um, is it part of a cause and effect trajectory that relates to the plot? So let's say, for instance, that um, I'm writing a memoir, for instance, and I'm talking about how I really like to have um, chocolate milkshakes every time that I go out to a restaurant when everybody else is drinking beer. Um, and I, because I like the way that it tastes, um, it's something that you know makes me, you know, transports me back to my childhood. Something about the coolness of the of the um, of the drink on my tongue. Blah blah blah. Um, there's no particular information. There's no particular reason for me to give you that information if it doesn't relate to the story that I'm telling. So if it's related somehow to the fact that um, I'm diabetic, and I shouldn't be having milkshakes. Um, and as a consequence of me having this milkshake when I'm out with my friends and everybody else is drinking beer, I um, um, lapse into some sort of um, ketoacidosis or something like that, and I go into a coma. Um, well, what does that tell you about my character? The fact that I would have done this knowing that I was diabetic. I'm reckless. I'm much more interested in sort of the immediate rewards of some um, gratification through having a milkshake than I am about my, the long-term consequences of, on my health. Um, could it be seen as a metaphor in any way? What does it tell you about, I guess, um, my choice to have a, this is a really weird example, I know, but my choice to have a milkshake when everybody else is having a beer. What does that tell you about sort of the way that I see my relationships and conformity and those types of things? Prioritize self budget over fitting into the group. Right. So I might have some sort of um, um, individuality Yeah. Um, that just because everybody else is having a beer, I don't feel especially um, uh, obliged to have one. Myself, I like milkshakes. Why can't I have a milkshake? That's what I want. It tells you a little bit more about my choice of beverage here. It tells you a little bit more about who I am as an individual. So that's just a really simplistic sort of way to get across the, um, some of the reasons that you would actually include sensory detail. If it relates to the plot, so I'm, so I'm flopping on the ground or something like that because I've had a milkshake, because I'm diabetic, you have to, of course, know that I was diabetic for that to make sense. It gives you insight into my character, I'm impulsive and reckless and stupid, basically, for, for doing this. Um, and, um, and it's a metaphor for sort of my view on social relationships and how I fit in as an individual within society. Here's a better uh, example, perhaps. This is an excerpt from um, Love in the Time of Cholera. Many of you have probably read this, but it's, a, it's an excerpt, it's a particular scene where um, the main character, Dr. Urbino, is in the, um, the former office of a colleague and a close friend of his who has just um, killed himself. He's committed suicide recently. So he's sort of looking around at the, um, the room and what's inside of the room. And the, um, it used to be, so the guy that killed himself was a photographer. So here, I'll, we'll just read it. In the parlor was a huge camera on wheels like the ones in public park, used in public parks, and the backdrop of a marine twilight painted with homemade paints, and the walls papered with pictures of children at memorable moments. The first communion, the bunny costume, the happy birthday, year after year, during contemplative pauses on afternoons of chess, Dr. Rubino has seen the gradual covering over of these walls, and he had often thought with a shudder of sorrow that in the gallery of casual portraits lay the germ of the future city, governed and corrupted by these unknown children, this should be, where not even the ashes of his glory would remain. So 
what does this tell you about Dr. Urbino and how he sees the world? He's definitely in an existential mindset, and at some point he's contemplating, and maybe it's in the wake of his friend's suicide, um, but he's contemplating the fact that eventually um, it, it could be almost as if he never existed, because all these children sort of peppering the walls um, uh, are going to replace him, and some them, and then somebody's going to replace them, and so on. Um, What else does it tell us about uh, maybe the, the person that used to use this as his office, the photographer who lived there before he killed himself? He wasn't a minimalist. Yeah, he wasn't a minimalist. <laughs> wasn't terribly organized as a person, yeah. perhaps. That's a bit like my, yeah. my, back, my desktop on my laptop. Sentimental, Sentimental. okay. He probably had children, okay, maybe, or he liked kids at least. This is what he did for a living. He played school. Yeah, he played chess also. Yeah, so he was his chess <laughs> mate. He was his friend. So he spent a lot of time together in this particular room. Um, so it tells us basically lots of things, both about the individual characters, Dr. Vino, and also the person that killed himself, and and also just sort of. Uh, it's a reflection on the underlying human condition, I think, of um, our fear of mortality. But, and I think this is probably a theme in Marquesa's writing um, through much of his works. I guess, ironically, um, he did obtain some immortality through this book. So thinking a little bit more about um, setting and mood and tone and voice and all these things, a good storyteller in putting it together is going to ask themselves when reflecting on their work, not only what happened and is it clear in terms of the plot line, but also how did it feel? How did it make the audience feel? It should put, it should create this sort of ambient mood in which the story is told. I forgot my um, my phone with my with my clock on it. Does anybody know what time it is? Twenty two. Okay. Can you tell me when it's I don't know seven two? Seven two. Okay. <laughs> sure. So here's a, um, an author who, at this time, I think he was writing for the Washington Post. He's quite good at setting these really um, rich, vivid scenes, a sense of place where uh, the particular aspects that he includes in terms of the itemized list um, really sort of brings it to life. So this is during the Iraq War. He said, on the storm's second day, the city of more than five million was coated in a film of dust blown in from Iraq's deserts. The sky turned from a blinding yellow at dawn to blood red in the afternoon. A dusk-like brown was followed by an eerie orange at nightfall. An occasional vegetable stand provided the city's few glimpses of color in its onions, tomatoes, eggplant, and oranges. Rain fell throughout the day, bathing Baghdad in mud. So look at his use of the vegetable stand in this context. Um, he, wasn't just, he wasn't just including these details about the colors of the, of the vegetables um, for, um, for any reason. It was because it was showing the, um, that sort of the strange resonant glare of the, of, the, of the light in this context and how it was refracting off of these objects. It's not just um, writing, of course, where we're trying to evoke a clear sense of mood and atmosphere, um, but it's also in, in filmmaking. This is the opening scene 
think it's the opening scene from Apocalypse Now. And it's only a minute or two long, but just pay attention to the sort of the feeling of being in this hotel room like the character and the stifling heat, the sweat, um, the particular lighting that is used, the use of the fan in terms of um, the shadow effects and so on. Look at the use of the objects, dog tag. I hardly said a word to my wife until I said yes to a divorce. When I was here, I wanted to be there. When I was there, all I could think of was getting back into the jungle. I'm here a week now. So how does this make you feel, this clip? What emotions does this evoke? Anxiety. Anxiety, okay. Depressed, okay. Restless. Restless. Trapped. Trapped, okay. Desperate. Desperate. All of these things. Would you say this is a, a powerful sort of um, emotional setting in terms of the scene, the scene and what's included and what's not included. Right. A related issue is, I guess, voice and style. Some people use voice and style interchangeably in those constructs. Um, but I think much of it has to do with whatever we call it. I, I suppose um, voice is more of a, a sort of the personality of the, um, of the communicator as it appears in writing, at least as it appears on the page. Can we sort of get a sense of who that person is through the way that they express themselves? Stylistic elements are more, um, um, I guess, I guess, um, more flexible in the sense that um, somebody can have a particular voice, but they can have different stylistic approaches to whatever they write. But much of it has to do with the sort of the formality of the prose, um, the, the level of diction that a person uses. Many of you have probably read um, John Krakauer's work, hopefully. He's really, he's a fantastic um, sort of natural history storyteller, I guess you would say. But um, in his book, Into the Wild, you can see the sort of the preciseness of his prose, the sort of almost, not stiffness of it, but the sort of the level of formal diction that he uses throughout his writing. Um, so here's an excerpt. Truthful responses to these queries were not likely to be well received by the rangers. McAndless could endeavor to explain that he answered to statutes of a higher order that as a latter-day adherent of Henry David Thoreau, he took as gospel the essay on the duty of civil disobedience and thus considered it his moral responsibility to flout the laws of the state. 
So um, it's very well written, but it's also quite formal in its presentation. You know, he's, he's writing, the canvas could endeavor to explain. Um, he could have just simply read, written, you know, he, he tried to tell them, and something along those lines. And this is characteristic of much of his writing. And it works well, but that's just his particular, that's his voice. He's quite formal in his prose. By comparison, we have somebody like Mary Roach, for instance, who you kind of get the sense that she's had a couple of glasses of wine sometimes with her writing, and she's quite, she's quite laid back and um, casual with the way that she expresses herself. And you see her personality come through quite clearly, I think, with her writing. Here's, a, here's an excerpt from Bonk. Homo sapiens is one of the few species on Earth that care if they're seen having sex. The impala is unconcerned. The dingo roundly flaunts it. A masturbating chimpanzee will stare straight at you. To any creature other than you and I and six billion other privacy-needing homo sapiens, sex is like peeling a mango or scratching your ear. It's just something you do sometimes. So those are completely different voices and styles, right, in terms of the way that they um, communicate, but they're both effective in doing so. The, the trick is to um, allow your personality to find itself in the way that it's expressed on the page um, or in your films. Um, and some, you know, some voices are much stronger than others. I think you could probably pick up a Mary Roach book and you would know exactly even if you didn't know that she wrote it, you could probably identify her as the author. Um, and other voices are just kind of more um, mainstream, or they kind of just they just kind of just blend into the chorus of other voices that are writing about science and so on. So um, the challenge is to try to find um, that place for your personality where um, you're not competing with as many others in that same space. So what is, whatever it is about your personality that makes your voice unique and original and individual, try to capitalize on that. Stylistically, um, we want to avoid the sort of, I guess, what uh, some essayists would call journalese, the, the type of um, writing that you find, say, for example, in the New York Times. I just pulled this out at random from the uh, from, uh, New York Times yesterday. This quote at the bottom. While Republicans would still be favored to pass a bill in a special in a special session, the unexpected turn of events on Sunday presents a new hurdle in their push to enact a far-reaching election law that would instill some of the most rigid voting restrictions in the country and cement the state as one of the hardest in which to cast a ballot. So there's sort of these long, convoluted, complicated, grammatically correct um, sentences and paragraphs that um, you would expect to find in professional reporting. You have to tell the news, of course, but it doesn't translate, it doesn't translate well in terms of stylistically in terms of storytelling. So contrast that with Bill Blundell, um, another author, um, and a well-known newspaper columnist, and he's talking about uh, Mount St. Helens, describing it. Nine miles east, Mount St. Helens rises like a white wall, its shattered summit bat banked in mist. So it's quite punchy, it's rhythmic, right to the point. Um, you see the metaphors sort of uh, emerging, um, and it's much more in line with what we'd like to read in terms of stories. Metaphors are critically important, really, with, I think, good storytelling. And it's something that we oftentimes take for granted. We don't necessarily notice them. Um, but they, they make stories distinct from the journalese styles that we, uh, that we encounter in newspaper articles. So we've read a couple of really atmospheric pieces recently uh, in, this, in this paper, including Virginia Woolf's The Death of the Moth. And you may or may not have noticed the, her use of metaphors. And this is really sort of a cornerstone of her of her stylistic approach, um, where she's talking about the rooks, too, were keeping one of their annual festivities, soaring around the treetops until it looked as if a vast net with thousands of black knots in it had been cast up into the air, which, after a few moments, sank slowly down upon the trees until every twig seemed to have a knot at the end of it. 
Then suddenly the net would be thrown into the air again in a wider circle this time with the utmost, obviously. And one thing that you'll notice with literary metaphors is that it's, it should be immediately obvious, immediately obvious what it's in reference to. So it doesn't take us a long time to try to disentangle or unravel what she's drawing a comparison to, you know, immediately because she's telling us that it looks like this sort of fishing net or a net that's been sort of cast up into the air and thrown back again. That's what the, um, uh, that's what the birds and their the sort of migratory patterns resemble. But you want to be sparing with metaphor. Um, too much of any of anything is a bad thing, and that includes metaphor. So you just kind of want to drop them sporadically along the course of your writing, including expository writing, to make it interesting um, to couch abstract concepts in concrete terms. How are you finding, I guess, at this stage with the paper, how are you finding the development of your, of your own voice? Is it something that you're struggling with? Is it something that you already came to this, this paper having a strong voice? Nathan, you're saying no, why? Or what, what are you finding difficult in terms of developing your voice, I guess? My background is uh, formal sciences, right. which requires almost no writing. Yes, yes. So I haven't really had that chance to develop my voice. So you need to allow yourself the, the luxury of having a personality in your, in your writing and your, and your storytelling in general. This is the time yeah. for your personality to express itself. I did come from a traditional writing background. And <clears throat> even so, I've only found that I'm actually able to kind of figure out what my voice is because previous experiences with literature where they're trying to teach you how to write. Something that I thought was, it wasn't because my writing was bad, so on me, but I thought it was the voice. So it's kind of discouraging, like having people be like, what is this? This doesn't make sense when I was writing for myself. So I had to like kind of burn it. So yeah. I'm only now kind of just getting a hang of what I am good at writing and what makes sense. Yeah. In the past, like, um, it takes time. Um, and I think the key is to relax and just allow yourself to be you on paper um, and not think too much about mimicking or trying to sound like authors that you respect. I mean, a lot of it actually, we talked about this before, it almost happens by osmosis in terms of um, uh, sounding like authors that you're reading. But eventually, um, when you just relax, take a deep breath and I mean even physically when you're sitting down at the computer and you're trying to, to write something you can oftentimes just you feel how tense you are you know with your back and your neck and if, if that if you if you see that happening um, do whatever you need to do to relax including well I guess I shouldn't say have a glass of wine but do whatever you need to do re to relax and just kind of see what happens organically by, by putting your personality on the page all right, we've got to stop there and um, transition over to Rebecca's visit.